A very warm welcome to um, Josh Sher and to St. Mary LeBeau. For some reason, we start everything here at five past the hour. I have no idea why, and I've never actually asked anybody. So, um, I, so if you'll, you'll thank you for sitting patiently and wondering why we're not beginning. Um, my first job is to introduce you to the next Josh Sher event, which is on that colored flyer, um, and that is a collaboration with Christian Aid, um, who are wanting to draw attention to their new um, method of raising funds for development through innovation and entrepreneurship. So that should be a very lively um, event on a new innovative process. Um, I'll tell you how th this evening is going to be managed when I get to the end, but one of the things I've noticed in recent days, rather to my surprise, is that the rhetoric about globalization has entered into the discussion about the rather surprising results that have emerged from elections both in Britain and America. And the suggestion is being made that it's the excluded communities who have voted so surprisingly, both in Britain and America, who have not profited from globalization. The history of Just Share, which goes back uh, about 15 years, and both uh, Wilf and Peter here are founder members of that long before I'd even been heard of, was that it was associated very closely with the anti-globalization riots in the city at that time. And there was a desire amongst um, some Christians and others to ensure that um, concern about the impact of globalization um, didn't get completely lost in um, the fear and the disapproval of the rioting. But that is a slightly surprising um, turn of events. And on the other hand, it is surely the case that a whole range of other issues about which we don't particularly talk are behind the events in global history that have been affecting the way people have voted of late. Now, Wilf Wild, as I say, a founder of Just Share, has a considerable reach across a number of academic and other areas, as well as a great fluency with the Christian tradition. His um, biography is on the printed sheet that you've all been given, and I'm not going to rehearse the whole thing because I want to give him a maximum amount of time to speak. So Wilf is going to um, talk for um, a good lecture length, but do feel free to leave um, if you have to at any stage. You won't give any offense about that. Um, and then after that, there will be a brief period for um, questions and answers. Then there'll be an opportunity for some refreshments. And you can also sign up at the back if you're not already on the Just Share uh, mailing list. And then if people want to, there will be an opportunity to join together in a smaller group. We might well go into the vestry and where people can actually express their views a bit more um, uh, uh, privately and fluently uh, other than by questions. That's a bit of an experiment, and we'll see how that goes this evening. But um, all, is, all is due to me is to thank Wilf enormously for his time and his energy and his commitment, and um, to welcome him to speak to us. Thank you. Thanks, George. It's uh, great to be here again. I think it's about 50 months ago I spoke on the Magna Carta, and um, George liked it so much that I got dinner. He's not actually heard the talk tonight, but I'm offered dinner again, so I'm hoping it doesn't suddenly get withdrawn about half past six. Anyway, I'd like to begin with a quote from a well-known political leader. Here it is. There's a higher ordering and we are all nothing else than its agents. I felt that the call of providence had come to me, and I give thanks to him and bow in humility before the Almighty, who in a few weeks has wrought a miracle upon us. Rather unfair at the beginning of my talk. Anyone like to guess who this political leader is? Interesting, that one. Churchill. Peter, I'll pick, pick you up on that later. One or two more? Just throw them out. Sorry? 
George Bush, <laughs> as in the US, George Bush. Uh, no, a good guess, though. Given the evangelical Christianity of the background, I'm not quite sure more about Churchill's. I thought somebody might say Donald Trump, because I'd originally put in European political leader for this. And then after a debate with my wife yesterday, I took it out. Actually, it's Adolf Hitler. It's in 1938, thanking God for the Anschluss, which was the forced union or conquest of Austria. I just want you to particularly at this moment note the religious language. Now, a 21st century CIA analyst might call this the speech of a Christian radical extremist. Would this help us understand the struggles of German imperialism and its rivals under Bismarck and the Kaiser? Or the Weimar Republic that weakness led to Hitler? No? Well, why would anyone think, therefore, that using the same language of Islamist radical extremists helps us to explain what is happening in the Middle East or indeed in the streets of Paris and Brussels or London? Does it, for instance, explain Mubarak's fall and the military coup in Egypt? Or why Gaddafi was removed when his checklist of sins is easily equaled by the Saudi regime in Arabia, especially after the war in Yemen? Or indeed, how the Assads and the military came to power in Syria and still hold it? To give you my conclusions up front, if we wish to have a more just share of the world's finite energy resources, we need not only to campaign about climate change, but against the background for this kind of activity, against imperialism, against neo-colonialism, against the new militarism in the UK, in France, in the USA, and yes, indeed, in Syria, in Egypt, Libya, Turkey, Brazil, Thailand, the list goes on, doesn't it? Where states of emergency, military coups, and dictatorships with a limited mandate symbolize the real new world order after the global recession of 2008. So in all of my analysis, I will not use the words Islamist, radical, extremist, or moderate, I will, I think, twice use the word terrorist. For such labelling has been used in our domestic policies as well to lie and to distort. When analysed in a broader historical and economic way, these terms are pure propaganda. They are not used by our mainstream media to explain. They are used to deflect from a proper assessment of the causes and consequences of our imperial military behavior externally and our too easy co-option to a security state internally. Witness the state of emergency in France now since November 2015. So this pretense of analysis is used to frighten and to label. Our 21st century rulers have been told many times that invading Afghanistan, and thereby Pakistan, and Iraq would only increase the risks to normal people on the streets of EU cities. To invade on the pretense of making us safe when they were clearly not going to do so was a lie. Like the many lies they have spun. Adding to them, perhaps, even worse lies over Libya and Syria. The invasions were for oil and for the control of the Middle East, for a continued hegemony for global capital. People in Paris and Brussels and London have been made the collateral damage. And it is this imperial context where the debates about climate change must begin. For one of the first key ideological cover-ups over the Paris attacks stemmed from a media that failed to make a connection between British and French imperial history 
and French colonial rule in Syria. Like the British after 1918, where our empire reached to its greatest ever extent, yet under the umbrella of a fuller parliamentary democracy, the French wanted imperial compensation for losses at Verdun and the Western Front. As we expanded in the Middle East to establish what is now Israel, took today's Iraq, and took land from Germany, the French were explicitly given today's Syria by Lloyd George. At the same time, we took the old Ottoman lands of Basra, from where we had invaded Iran twice, Baghdad and Mosul, to make sure that we had the oil of the south and the oil in Kirkuk. Let the French have Syria, said Lloyd George. There's only a little oil there, and ironically, that was just enough to sustain Assad and then ISIS on the new post sykes pico borders with Iraq. So French rule in Syria, or shall we call it divide and rule, lies at the heart of 20th and 21st century Syria, in the same way that French rule set the tone for post-war Algeria and 1960s Vietnam. France has never properly come to terms with its colonial sins in, Algeria, in Algeria, which in effect created the present Gaulist Fifth Republic. And no one I have seen is emphasized, I have seen, has emphasized their history in Syria. But the people in Syria know. When there was a dispute, you might remember, in the Parliamentary Labour Party, when one of its imperial stooges claimed that the Paris attacks could have been anywhere. Then, to blame the war on Syria for the attacks in Paris was, in effect, an excuse against these dastardly works. There is one sense in which this rationale is right. As I have argued, our wars in the Middle East have made us all more vulnerable. On the other hand, there is a link between Paris and Syria that we do well to remember. And that particular history after 1918 is worth telling. For the French occupied Syria militarily after 1918. They put down resistance from all sides of society, Sunni, Shia and Druze. They ended up bombing Damascus from the air and with artillery in 1925, just as is done today. And like the British in the same era, this was deliberately done to create a terror. And the words were first used, good call that Peter, by that great British politician, Winston Churchill. Having lost Syria in World War II and then been put back in again by the British, and as they did even more in the Lebanon, the French then set up a form of sectarian rule in Syria from the late 1920s that emphasized the ethnic divides by determining seats in parliament to each of the main communities, putting a largely Sunni merchant middle class in charge of a largely Shia underclass, first in the rural south and then in the cities. And this set up Syria as so often in Africa and the Middle East, so it needed a strong ruler. The Assads came to power in 1970 as creatures of the military, after coups sometimes backed by the CIA. For all the hogwash about Assad and desired regime change, the media has never said that really it's the military that is in power in Syria, and it has been for two generations. It's one reason why the response to a genuine protest movement in the South in 2011 was so violent. It is also the reason why the removal of Assad, now unlikely in any case given Iranian and Russian support, would not make very much difference to the underlying political and even more the economic realities. Indeed, the removal of Assad could make it worse. The problem with the lack of insight from our mainstream is that they asked the wrong questions. They have managed to work out that at least for the Syrian refugees, their problems have been caused by the war, 
The problem is that although they describe the effects of the war since 2012, they have not analyzed what caused it. Or if you want to get personal, who caused it? The assumption is that it must be something to do with the protest movements that began like so much else in the Arab Spring of 2011. So evil President Assad and or evil ISIS, take your pick or blame both, have been putting the people down in blood. The fact that there is some truth in this description is used to hide the deeper questions. Or with 10 minute study, as the Syrian protest movement rapidly turned into a civil war, the question became and becomes who funded and armed the rebel movements? And perhaps still who funds Assad? Well, the latter is easily dealt with in throwaway BBC lines. Assad is now supported by Russia and Iran, so a casual listener, unused to the alliances of global politics, would assume it must be their fault. This is handy because, of course, we know about Russia's aggressive intentions. Recently stated as a fact in The Telegraph, in the Ukraine, don't we now? By such casual throwaways, a propaganda case is built. Actually, until he lost his eastern, eastern oil fields to ISIS, Assad's army was largely funded by oil revenues, which is why ISIS also grabbed them. So their funding was based, part based on oil as well. But who funded ISIS before that and why? The who is relatively simple, but you would not learn about it in 95% of our media coverage. Robert Fisk and Patrick Coburn, both mainstream journalists, set out clearly that the evil gifting of ISIS to the world is first and foremost at the door of Saudi Arabia. We could throw the door a little wider and say that all the Gulf states were allowing their elite of oil rich to fund ISIS. And the USA knew they were doing it. And until the loss of Mosul in 2014, they turned a blind eye. Turkey also played a major part by logistically supporting the rebels, allowing them into Syria, and trying to orchestrate the cover of the so-called Syrian National Congress and the Free Syrian Army. Qatar was foremost in this latter game too, as it was backing the Muslim Brotherhood factions in Egypt. So if we say that the Saud regime may take the recent blame, they have been aided and abetted for a century by the US and British elites. The Americans supported all this because they did not like Assad. The instability they deliberately caused in Iraq for divide and rule purposes Yes, the instability and the divide was deliberate and not a mistake. They then knocked on into Syria, where there was already an artificial border created by the British and the French. The Israelis went along with this with some caution because they didn't like Assad either. And they hated his other backers, Iran and Hezbollah, far more. Their worry was that at least Assad was the devil they knew. The other devils might turn out to be even worse. So it has proved. In Britain, as we've always done, by Harold Wilson's failure to send troops to Vietnam, we backed our special relationship and played lapdog to the USA. This is, of course, the real reason why Blair took us into Iraq. It was all about the USA and nothing to do with Iraq at all. So Syria may even have started as a genuine civil war, but I doubt it. But by the end of 2011, after a similar game had been applied to Libya, external powers were rapidly starting to use Syria for their own ends. For if you want a more violent protest movement, and a consequently genuine social a civil war, you only have to go round the corner to Yemen. Because the wrong side was winning in Yemen, 
who had been fighting the Saudis for over a decade and had started to win, the Saudis then intervened there too. What has become ever clearer is that in this process, they have made a desolation in Syria and in Yemen. So if you haven't picked this up already, let's name names. Those powers external to Syria, responsible in large part for this war, as they so obviously are in Yemen, are the Saudis. Now coming from academia, where I'm presently based, this is very difficult things to say, because the universities take substantial Gulf funds. The academics have been literally bought off. So, in the following order, I would then blame the Turks, and then the USA, and then Qatar, and then Israel, and then the UK and France. For we were busy trying to raise, train, and fund rebel boots on the ground as recently as 2013. So as the EU bears the brunt of the Syrian, Syrian refugees, try to remember who caused this mess. Our own elites playing their own games of empire building. And this is where the BBC and the media fall down. It's too easy. Membership of the same elites precludes it from asking the right questions, and therefore its answers are half-baked at best. If bombing Syria and Iraq and Libya and Afghanistan, how long a list do you need, cause these problems in the first place, how is more bombing going to solve the problem? Maybe we should do like the, S, the US, well we do, send more and more illegal drone strikes on people in Syria or Libya or Yemen who are supposed to be threatening terror on the streets of Britain. Well, the folk there are at least somewhat justified as our elites are certainly threatening terror and have done so repeatedly on their streets. And where do the Saudis buy all their weapons from when they, buy, when they bomb Yemen? Six billion a year spend on UK arms last year and a hundred billion dollar deal with Obama. The Saudis, aided by the CIA, who were trying to write the older Assad's obituary in power as early as the 1980s, have wanted to destroy Assad for a long time as part of their struggle, mainly against Iran, for regional hegemony, conveniently dressed as Sunni versus Shia. The Saud family state in Arabia was encouraged and funded by the UK and USA from early in the last century, so even before they had the oil. As their client ruler in Arabia against the Ottoman Empire, it has always been a conquest state. It has been pinching land off others and in the Yemen since the 1920s. And their plan seems to be that they will now have two old regional rivals dictatorial Egypt and Syria dependent on their control and maybe funding. With the oil price halved and the Saudi break-even price reputedly at $100, this looks to me like another way into hell. There is no way in the long run, with oil prices at $40, that Saudi wars are sustainable. At some point, they will need the oil price back at $150. And the Saudi king needs successful wars for his propaganda. A new king, by the way. So a nasty outcome has been set from this terrible start. ISIS is, of course, the product of at least three imperialist wars. First, the illegal invasion of Iraq. Second, the NATO war for regime change in Libya, ut utilizing Al-Qaeda-linked militia as proxy ground forces. And third now, the proxy war in Syria. Those carrying out the ISIS attacks in the EU, as in the Charlie Hebdo attack and in the November the 13th Paris shootings, proved to be linked to the recruitment by the EU of fighters for Syria, 
They were well known to the intelligence agencies and closely monitored, but they were allowed to travel freely. After each attack, there was an increased buildup of security forces and police state powers. France has now had a state of emergency longer than at any time in its democratic history. As the climate change deal was being discussed in Paris, over 3,000 house searches were conducted, but there was only one person charged. Environmental activists were placed under house arrest. In December 2015, striking workers were fired and Goodyear workers sentenced to prison. Turkey also has a state of emergency now. And a day before Trump's election, democratically elected ethnic Kurdish parliamentary leaders were arrested. There have now been more terror bombings in Turkey than in France. So many, it is difficult to know in this deep state who is doing what to whom. President Erdogan has only himself to blame having almost got the US involved by a chemical attack the Turks faked to look like Assad in September 2013, which Obama discovered late. You have to read Seymour Hersh's leaks from the US intelligence to find the truth of this fake near pretext, as our media has steadfastly failed to address the news. The Turks have also played the game of pinching territory out of Syria since the 1920s. Their decision in July 2015 to join the bombing game late against ISIS was really about pinching more territory in the north. They really would have liked the old area of Aleppo as part of their recreation of the Ottoman Empire. But if they can make a new northern buffer and no-fly zone, for humanitarian reasons, for refugees, you understand, they may settle for that, especially if they can destroy the autonomy of the Syrian Kurd-led new governments of Rojava in the north of Syria and attempt to crush the PKK Kurdish movement, also sliding into an all-out war in their own Kurdish-dominated southeast. As these outcomes looked increasingly unlikely for Turkey, it probably accounts for their shift of strategy after May 2016, when you may remember, after an accidental or on purpose downing of a Russian plane in the previous year, it looks as if the Turks realized they have bitten off more than they could chew. By 2016, Russian tourist sanctions were hurting the Russians and Iranians looked increasingly like winning in Syria, in Aleppo, for example. And so the Russian-Turkish deal was barely inked in before the attempted military coup came in July of 2016. The US had clearly struggled with Erdogan. And if the CIA did not know that the coup was coming, organized in part from their own air base in Turkey, it would have been, and was, a gross CIA failure. So to climate change. If we have a result energy policy known as fighting wars, is this changed by the Paris climate deal? Contrary to NGOs like Christian Aid, I regard the prime Paris climate change agreement of December 2015 as changing basically nothing. It had a substantial cost and energy footprint all of its own, while being largely an exercise in global PR. It commits none of the 196 nations to a single action. The document sets non-binding targets for gas emissions on voluntary submissions, which do not even represent a reduction in projected future emissions. The leaders of 20 small island nations in the Pacific were fobbed off with cash. And their demand that the deal should limit the rise in temperatures to 1.5 degrees rather than the 2% suggested originally 
was ignored. Yet Obama declared the accord a turning point in efforts to prevent climate change. French President Hollande took the prize for grotesque overstatement. At the same time of talking of a peaceful revolution for climate change in Paris, Hollande oversaw the state of emergency in France, part of which I've mentioned was a brutal crackdown by French police and military on environmental demonstrators. So there is more than just a geographic link in Paris between the attacks of November and the PR games of December. As one critic put it, the PR operation was a success, but the patient died. The leaders of the major powers got what they wanted in Paris, the pretense of action on climate change with as little cost as possible. The main success of the Paris conference was to massage expectations in advance and then over deliver on them so that the press and the NGOs, often with short term lobbying positions to consider, were rapturous in praise. The Paris conference was hailed by the corporate press as a triumph of international collaboration. The New York Times called it a historic breakthrough. The Guardian celebrated determined diplomacy and an end to the fossil fuel era. Come back to that in a minute. The NGOs campaigning on climate change were full of what we have achieved and could never have envisaged a deal that was so ambitious. Christian Aid wrote of a potential for a new dawn. Set against this PR self-serving hype, I am more tempted to believe leading climate scientist James Hansen, who characterized the deal as a fraud and a fake, declaring it's just worthless words. There is no action, just promises. Stefan Bohm of Essex University said, I have serious doubts that the actual tools that are supposed to deliver the much needed emission cuts will work fast enough if at all. And one clue to the UK's real embarrassment is that it slid its new carbon budget targets out on the 30th of June 2016, almost unnoticed in the Brexit aftermath. The naivety and hype here are astonishing. NGOs caught by the marketing bug, unable to do a critical analysis on themselves, or being caught by state govspeak and PR. This has happened before in the Make Poverty History campaign, which I attacked in part in my first book. Christian Aim claimed on Paris, if governments are serious about these commitments, then the era of dirty investments is over. Miles Owen at Oxford, I think, is a great deal more realistic. The idea that we will develop a cheaper substitute for every application of fossil carbon everywhere before temperatures reach two degrees higher is, I quote, fantasy. What the NGOs have done instead is, treat, is retreat with prim satisfaction into a private prohibition caller called disinvesting from fossil fuels. Just as world oil and energy demand hit new highs, right through the global slowdown, with just one blip down in 2009. So the new moralists in the NGOs feel they have done their bit for the earth, with no comment, because it's too political, on capitalist imperialism, new colonialism, and the wars of the Middle East and North Africa. Back to my favorite overhyped media. The New York Times and the Wall Street Journal in the US have remained enthusiastic proponents of the Middle Eastern wars more honestly than our own media. They argued that the Chilcot inquiry, quote, tells us nothing we didn't know and constitutes, quote, an exercise in self-flagellation by the British establishment. My first reactions were similar from a left perspective, as the bigger questions, never mind the war's legality, were left unasked. Questions about the nature of the special relationship, 
our foreign and defense policy being dominated by the US and NATO, and the geopolitics of energy all went unanswered. Nor did the media look at the ethnic tensions the US State Department and CIA knew that the Iraq war would unleash on behalf of a neoliberal empire's divide and rule. During one of my first geopolitical energy talks at Durham University, one of the students asked politely, so what? That political void known as parliament after Chilcot demonstrated that our ruling elite have in reality the same view with so what appearing to be their predominant response. On the first day of debate, only 50 MPs bothered to show up with as few as 20 MPs present for day two, mainly to defend themselves. When an 81-year-old veteran Labour MP, Paul Flynn, stood up and argued that Chilcot is a thunderous verdict of guilty, not just for one man, but for this House, the previous government, the opposition, and three select committees, we are guilty and judge guilty of commanding our valiant troops to fight a vain, avoidable war. In response, other Labour MPs walked out in protest. The British mainstream coverage still suffered from the same British imperial hubris as Blair, as if it was his decision that made the war. Bush was going to war, with or without us, and Blair saw that. The lives of soldiers were thrown away on an imperial mission. The gains, the potential control of the Middle East, and specifically Iraq's oil, would go to an empire in which they have little say. This is equivalent to 1916. As for all the memorials to the Somme, we are not told that the, raw, the war was run in Britain by the imperial war cabinet, and its outcome was British control of Iraq and Syria, amongst other places. The Chilcot Report has served its purpose for the ruling elite, who have used it to try and wash their hands of Iraq and to move on. But it should be remembered that all of our mainstream political parties have at the very least failed to understand what is going on in the Middle East, and at the very worst, backed an imperialist capitalist war. It was New Labour, most of the Tories, and not simply Blair, who backed the war in Iraq, just as it did without thinking in Afghanistan. And just 24 of 257 Labour MPs voted against more air attacks on Iraq in September 2014, as the then party leader Ed Miliband lauded military action. Now we know that if Blair lied over Iraq, David Cameron lied too on what was really going on to produce the bombing of Libya. But as with Blair over Iraq, the same is true over Cameron's recent scapegoating over Libya by the Foreign Affairs Select Committee report. If he had not lost Brexit and resigned, we would have another serving prime minister who tried to mislead us at best. Yet virtually the entire British establishment backed the Libyan bombing. 557 MPs voted for it. Only 15 MPs had the good sense in 2011 to vote against it. And since they are now in government and directing UK strategy in Syria, it is worth noting especially that only one Tory MP voted against the Libyan bombing. And nor did a single Liberal Democrat, then in coalition of course, vote again. Voted against it. They had squandered their criticism over Iraq and no longer had Charlie Kennedy. It was perfectly clear to me at the time that the West had moved fast to make sure in the face of an insurgency it generated and funded, as in Syria, to keep control of Libya's oil reserves. Indeed, the French were promised 70% of them, 
Now, rather like Syria, if we cannot control the Middle East, real CIA and Pentagon policy is to try and make sure that no one is in control. It's often said, and worth remembering, that Libya has the largest oil reserves in Africa. That's true, 48 billion barrels to be exact. What isn't often mentioned is that Libyan oil reserves are higher than those of the US. As with Iraq, the real game is for the control of future scarce fossil fuels, especially oil and gas, which no green scenario sees us doing without before 2050. Now we have virtually no Libyan oil put, output, but a weak and dependent official government propped up by the West, as in Afghanistan. What kind of tough oil deals will it write? We now have three parliamentary sanctioned reports, with the Defence Select Committee on Syria reporting in September 2016, which have shown the extent of the lies, the moral bankruptcy, and the propaganda-driven shallowness of British imperial, military and foreign policy under four prime ministers with three different political colours. This is not a party political problem, but the result of a political void the ruling elite has driven us into and has led us on to Donald Trump. In August 2016, under a new Theresa May government, as the US recommenced airstrikes in Sirte in Libya, Defence Secretary Michael Fallon made a point of an increased British commitment to Iraq and Afghanistan, only a month after the lies exposed in the Chil Chilcot report. For he was anxious to show that, to U the US and NATO that Brexit would not mean a withdrawal for British imperialism. And both Fallon and the RAF emphasised the scale of British air attacks. Yet the latest Defence Committee report noted and then quickly forgotten in the Brexit deluge is the most rigorous and best informed British attempt to determine the nature of the political and military battlefield in which the UK is engaged in Iraq and Syria. It focuses on the lack of a coherent political strategy, which I would largely summarise as follow the US and repeat their propaganda. Having ruled out acting in concert with the Assad government against ISIS, his regime displacement is likewise the centrepiece of British policy. Or should that be the only piece? The report went on to say that the government had only phantom, phantom allies and the Ministry of Defence failed or refused to provide it with a full analysis of British airstrikes in Syria. This is not a journalist, but a parliamentary select committee. It is also leaking out that British Special Forces are operating in Libya and Syria without parliamentary sanction. We are justifying our secret military presences in the same way as would an ISIS. Given that Mrs Thatcher won an election in 1983 when her opinion poll rating shot up from 30% to 50% after the Falkland War, Mrs May may find the same track appealing talking honeyed words about industrial democracy and inequality at home, whilst trying to be the Iron Lady in her relations with abroad. You can tell there is propaganda involved, for the elite does not lie. If it does not lie, it overplays its hand. So as we come back to oil again, we are told that North America has an oil and gas revolution that word again. It will become a new hub of oil production and will be self-sufficient, aided, of course, by fracking. This is held out to us as our way forward by those who want fracking in the Yorkshire Moors, the Fylde Coast, or the South Downs. It's a clever use of misinformation, like Russian aggression, endlessly repeated as if it was a fact. <clears throat> 
for North America, sometimes it's extended to the Americas, is not the same as the USA. So shall I say clearly, from an oil analyst point of view, the US will not be in any way self-sufficient in oil for the foreseeable future. I will give you the numbers in a minute. The story about the oil price usually told is of the strength or otherwise of OPEC. And for much of the last 40 years, that's been about our old friends, the Saudis, and it's her ability to increase output or not in sympathy with the West when required. In late 2014, the oil price started to fall when it appeared that the Saudis were about to open their taps afresh as oil prices peaked at around $110 a barrel. But for all the fuss about this, Saudi output only rose about half a million barrels a day in 2015 to 12 million barrels a day. The other big propaganda game in the mainstream has been the rise of US oil output, I mentioned it previously, to its highest ever, 12.7 million barrels a day in 2015, making it the largest producer in the world again for the first time since 1976. Russia overtook it then. This clearly reduces the political risks in global oil output and perhaps justifies such a huge fall in the price at its lowest to $30 in January 2016. Well, it's now around $50, about half the 2011 to 14 Arab Spring prices. And for most of that four years, US output was rising rapidly. For the rising oil price made fracking economic. So to be economistic about it, prices led output, not the other way around. For in 2016, US oil output is coming down again. For all the revolutionary rise which the media has made so much about, the US still imported a huge 6.6 million barrels a day in 2015. And only two countries in the world produce more than this amount. It's about 35% of its demand. It's on the demand side we should worry about globally. For it's the need for fossil fuels to generate the energy gap in transport and heating that drives the carbon and other emissions. As oil prices fell in 2015, oil demand went to its highest ever level at over 95 million barrels a day. And the biggest increases were in Africa, China and India. Whilst the UK and German oil demand fell to its lowest for 50 years, China's demand increases in the past 10 years is more than the entire oil demand of the UK, Germany and France put together. India's oil demand increase in the last 10 years accounts for the total demand of Italy and Spain. The longer oil prices stay down at $50, the worse this demand effect will be. Meanwhile, US demand for gasoline reached an all-time high in June 2016. Wind and solar as yet cannot fuel cars enough. So much talk about a totally renewable energy policy focuses only on electricity and ignores the as yet irreplaceable role of oil and gas. There is one more key player in this, partly overlooked in all the talk of Mosul and ISIS. For the Bush neocon strategy of taking over Iraq's oil resources since 2003, and not only by US, but EU, Russian, Indian, Chinese, and even African oil companies, has finally been paying off. Iraqi oil output has more than doubled since 2003, and in 2015, it rose to 4 million barrels a day. The rise in Iraqi output in that year was by far the largest of any other producer. And in the same year, it passed its old record. Iraq now produces more 
than at any other time since the rule of Saddam in 1979, when at 3.5 million barrels, it was set to minimize the impact of the Iranian revolution. In 2016, at 4.4 million barrels a day, Iraq is the fourth largest oil producer in the world and the third largest exporter. The three, Saudi, Russia, and Iraq, and the world largest importer, the US, are all heavily involved in the wars of the Middle East in 2016. Why is the mainstream media and our elite behind them not making the blindingly obvious connection? It is not terrorism that we are fighting, but for oil and gas, and with it for the control of the Middle East. The oil markets have actually been saying that the real geopolitical realities have not changed much since evil ISIS took Mosul in 2014, for the oil price has stayed down. For of course, the oil in Iraqi Kurdistan is still, is still safe and being developed. Kurdistan reserves on their own would make it the 10th largest reserve nation, almost as big as Libya. And so are all the major southern oil fields near Basra still being developed. If Mosul is reconquered, then the oil situation is even safer. And this may be the reason for going to all that trouble, rather than to rescue the 1.5 million people. Viewing the oil price in this more political framework, it's been telling us that the counter-revolution in the Middle East, led by the Saudis and Turks, and supported by the US, and by also by derivation by us, has won even if it was not much of a revolution in the first place. But at least there had been a potential for a real democratic revolution, as in Iran in 1979. Syria now may well keep its Assad, but it will be in ruins and divided for at least a generation, if not longer. Half its population have left the desolation. How many will return? The last real threat was Yemen, and the Saudis worrying about threats in their own oil backyard have been clearly and deliberately doing what I call a Vietnam on it. In other words, bombing it back to the Stone Age if they can. You could say that this rise in oil output is hardly a gain for Iraqis, given who might gain from the wealth. But whoever said empires cared about the poor or their deaths? Capital cries crocodile tears while it attempts to swallow the Middle East live. The growth of militarism in the foreign policy of NATO with open preparations against Russia and China and an increased military-style repression internally within the USA are becoming increasingly incap incompatible with the expansion of democratic forms of rule. After Egypt in Africa in 2013, came Thailand in Asia in 2014, very little reported that military dictatorship, and a de facto coup against social democracy in Brazil in 2016. So I'd like to return to the use of the word extremist for labeling your political enemies, which has a history. Gateskill, for instance, on the Labour right, used it against the Bevanites. It was used against Tony Benn before he was respectable and spoke at Just Share. The earliest use of the word I could find was by Stephen Gardner. Known to those who follow, follow Hilary Mantel, as the enemy of Thomas Cromwell, often called Wiley Winchester when he was bishop there. Gardner used the word extremist against all the Protestants who'd been in power after Henry VIII claimed royal supremacy over the church. 
So most of us Protestants sitting here today would have been called extremists by Gardner. Sadly, rather like the mainstream media, the English church response to the wars of the empire of global capital has been muted and superficial. As the world situation has got worse since 2003 and 2008, the English church and its leaders have spoken with authority less and less in the last 10 years. For example, the Church of England Synod's decision to support the concept of UK bombing in Syria in December 2015 played into the political games of the ruling Tory elite. Today, as we enter the third decade of an endless war ruining the Middle East and Central Asia, my belief is that the theology of the English church is in as great a state of impasse, potentially of crisis, as in the time of Gardner. Whilst we have been sleepwalking into an ever greater and politically military deep hole since 2003, our plight compares badly with the ability of the English church and its theologians to address our world's issues politically, economically, socially, theologically, and spiritually. To put it simply, they seem to me to have no clue as to what is going on. Our imperial past, theologically unquestioned, generates an inability to see clearly what is going on in our imperial present. I finished writing this talk in the Scots Highlands. So who better to quote than the speech of a Highland warrior called Calgacus, quoted in Tacitus. To robbery, butchery, and rapine, they give the lying name of government. They create a desolation and call it peace. This is, I'm afraid, what the empire of capital has been doing in Iraq and elsewhere since 2003. It is akin to the political theology with which Paul attacks the concept of Pax Romana in his epistle to the Romans. For, of course, the Romans did not bring peace. And Christ, in today's terms, here's a bit of a throwaway, controversial line for the seminar, was not crucified alongside two thieves, but alongside, in the Greek, two bandits, two terrorists in today's terms. For in the Roman Empire, Jesus was a radical extremist too. And I think that's just about enough of me being depressing. Well, no one will say you're not um, interesting and don't have views. Um, and now there's an opportunity for us to um, uh, question you about some of those in a bit more detail, um, which will be remarkable given the extraordinary sweep of the, um, of the issues you've attended to. Um, and I get to ask the first um, question, I suppose. Um, I, don't think, I don't think Bishop Gardner and Assad have ever been mentioned in the same discourse, but there we go. And I wasn't really sure that many would currently identify Donald Trump with any kind of elite, but, um, but perhaps eventually. Rich man. Rich now, what, what, yes, I see. Okay, yes, yes, good point. Um, what you do is you paint a vast canvas, really, of cynicism, hypocrisy, illegality, and deceit, not just on the part of politicians, uh, and we could kind of cope with that kind of charge, yeah. but also on the part of public servants, diplomats, soldiers, that everyone's in it together, and it's, does, it feels ever so slightly as if it's going to stray into a conspiracy theory. And I'm just wanting to ask, what is it that you actually want to defend in the Middle East? Um, is it national statehood? Is it um, ethnic integrity? Is it democratic institutions? Is it the poor? And if so, how? Um, I, don't, I can't quite see who you think can be defended. Uh, the possibility of ordinary people, uh, which in the Middle East are largely poor, 
to have control over their own lives, economically, politically, spiritually, socially. And I think the power of outside intervention over at least 100 years has turned that possibility into a desolation. Um, which is why when I was in the Scottish Highlands, which is denuded of its population after 100 years of military rule, um, the, it, the analogy with what's going on in Syria and, and Yemen came across so strongly. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is Jesus was executed because he stood against an empire. And actually the local elite colluded with that empire, were frightened with him, and had to put him to death, if you like, for the sake of the nation. And what I'm warning about is our empire, which is global and which is about capital, which dominates us not only militarily, politically, and economically, but in danger of doing it theologically and spiritually as well. I don't know if that's a good answer. Uh, but, Most helpful. Um, um, so it's a warning, really. It's a warning. Um, so who else would like to ask a question? Yes. You need to, there's going to be a microphone, which Emily's going to bring to you, and it's very important that you hold that very close to your mouth. Hi. Um, your point of views are very... Even closer. Hello. <laughs> Um, you've done a lot of research to enable you to uh, get a very clear-cut point of view. Um, and uh, the other side, you criticise the media for not actually covering the story accurately. Why can't you get your story in the media? Uh, well, it's a good question, that, isn't it, really? Um, because they don't want to hear it. Uh, I would use not me, who, who wouldn't be seen necessarily as um, an investigative journalist, but I think the best case is the Seymour Hirsch story that I mentioned in passing, which I don't know if anybody's heard of here. Has anybody he read of that story? It's quite clear there, if you go through the details, because it's a leak from US intelligence agencies basically trying to save their own bacon. You may remember back in September of 2013, we were debating whether we should bomb Syria at that point. And you may also remember that the Americans backed off from it and the, the vote here was lost. And some of it was suggested because it was lost here under the, when Cameron was PM, that that's why the Americans backed off. And it wasn't the reason. The reason the Americans backed off is that they realized that the Turks had tried to fool them and that actually al-Nusra had used the chemicals against their own people to try and get Obama to cross his, his own red lines. And I think when you read the story, it looks, it looks right. But the point was that Seymour Hersh has had a number of stories like that. He's very well known for them, but nobody, but nobody in the US was, would publish it. So he had to actually get it published in the London Review of Books in the UK. So it did get published here. But, but I, I tell the story because if it's so difficult for a journalist like that to get the story into the mainstream media, even more difficult for someone like me who's an outsider. The other point I made, which I've seen unfortunately too much in my time in university because I've been running an energy institute on and off for two or three years, is to see the power of funding to co-opt and subvert. So a lot of the academics will not say the truths because it would be to bite the hand that's feeding them. And we, I could go on at length, but I, I think it, it, it is a difficult, and that's why I'm here, really. It is a difficult story to get into the mainstream media. A lot of um, people actually find that's they right. have point, points of view that are um, very kind of radical, and they, they do this in effect through the social media channels because um, that's where WikiLeaks kind of really sort of evolved. Um, there's something 360 and sometimes Huffington Post yeah. feel a little bit sort of, and it'd be really important that you persevere and not get caught in, in funding issues, yeah. change your yeah. name, have a pen yeah. name or something. Yeah. Any I other questions? 
Um, thank you, firstly, for an interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, taking it back to that sort of climate change side of things, um, if, if this sort of empire of oil and empire of capital is, is so hell-bent on, on continuing that status quo and dominating Middle Eastern politics due to continuation of a fossil fuel regime, what, how do these tensions play out in a warming world if, if that ecological collapse, as predicted by our scientific community, is as dire as it really seems to be. How are these tensions of empire going to play out in the world, especially in relation to that fossil fuel economy? Well, I'm not sure I want Wilkes to speculate about the future of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, when um, fossil fuel demand started to go down, it was because the oil price was very high. So I think it's almost back to, it's the economy, stupid. If the oil price goes very high, and I've got oil central heating. That's the only easy way to cut fossil fuel demand. Because I think these promises out of climate change talks, you can do it fine electricity. We could probably get to a stage where 100% of our electricity comes from non-fossil fuels. In fact, in some days of the best wind and solar, you could get very close to that. Um, you still got problems because Solar isn't always there in the winter, and wind doesn't always blow when it's solidly cold. So you would still need backups. And the most, I mean, in the recent bidding round for Ofgem, for instance, they even had diesel at low prices being bid in to fill the gaps between solar and wind. So we probably won't entirely be able to do without gas. We could probably do without coal and go very close to 100% in electricity. But all it means then is that the pressure is on transport. I mean, I think the BP forecast of 2050 is that 70% of the demand for oil, which they're talking of, say, over 100 million barrels a day, would be in transport fuels. So it's our cars and it's our planes and it's our heating system that are basically the problems. Yes, question? It's all right. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for your talk, Mr. Wilder. Ashley Dickinson of the Christian People's Alliance Party. You mentioned Vietnam. Why should we have sent troops to Vietnam? Because wasn't that an absolutely vain conflict? Well, that's the first question. Then secondly, as Syria could be absolutely become more dangerous if Assad were to be removed, should this nation and the US not be well, in the most daring cooperation with Russia since the Second World War be siding with them to keep Assad in power in order to defeat ISIS? Because as I say, we don't know what could happen if he were to be removed and keeping his opponents in, say, safe refugee camps. Starting with the, the last question first, I think all I'm trying to say about Assad is that he's a creature of the military and a relatively liberal frontman for the military. And one of the reasons I think he himself has had difficulties is it's the military that were pushing in the early days for the violent response to the Arab Spring-style protests that were smaller and more localized and less coherent in Syria and then rapidly got taken over by external powers. Now, if Assad went, and the re unless the regime was completely destroyed, and I think with the Russians and Iranians and Hezbollah, that's not going to happen, you would likely get an even more strong arm ruler. So in other words, all I'm saying is you'd have an even more blatant and explicit military regime. And of course, in a way, if it's a competition for a client state, then the Russians are basically saying, we can play this game too. If it's our client state, we'll manage it in our way. I'm not, I'm not quite sure about the point about Vietnam, except I would say that the Americans were very clear that what they were doing there was to try and eliminate what they call the virus of communism. And they were quite prepared, as, as I use the term from an American general at the time, to bomb Vietnam back to the Stone Age in order to make their point. I think it was right of Harold Wilson not to join in with that process. And actually, he was in a much more difficult position than Blair. We owed a lot of money to the Americans in the IMF. Our economy was weak. And actually, Wilson, I mean, I, as a young radical at the time, criticized Wilson for making all the right noises to the Americans, but doing nothing. Actually, I think, given the experience we've had under Blair and other prime ministers since, 
I think Wilson handled that problem rather well in hindsight. One more short question before refreshments. Sir. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, that was really interesting. I just had a question regarding the causality and correlation sometimes you draw. It's, I do agree with you that there's a lot of, there are imperial tendencies into Western interventions in Syria and, and in the Middle East, but how, how can you so almost easily write off the fact that there are millions of civilians there who do need protecting from some force or another, be it inf interventionist or regional or even local? So how can you write off an intervention of that scale as simply being an imperialistic tendency with no moral, moral leaning at all? There are 80 million Egyptians, there are 80 million Iranians, there, there were, I don't know, 20 million Syrians, 20 million Iraqis. I think the best defense for the people in the Middle East is the people themselves. Now, I would prefer in an ideal world for that not to be a military defense. But I think my answer would be their own best defense is themselves. The danger with even the, I mean, in Libya, I think, gives a really good example of what pretends to be humanitarian intervention to protect people actually causes far more deaths than the, the deaths they were supposedly trying to prevent, which actually was a cover because they weren't getting into Libya for that reason. It was an excuse. And that's the danger with these humanitarian interventions. It's the outsiders whose interests really should lie with themselves start to intervene in other people's lives it is a huge problem after 200 years of imperialism and colonialism for people in the Middle East as elsewhere, Africa and so on, to stand up for themselves and say, this is our land, this is our fight, we will fight it if we have to fight. Now, what you do in terms of supplying them with arms and, and all those issues, I, I think are very complicated. But I'm saying the reason the West has been involved has not been for humanitarian reasons. They've been entirely pursuing it for their own political strategic reasons. And as soon as we can start to see through that, to see through that we're being lied to and that our soldiers are dying in foreign fields for causes that are not theirs and not actually for the people there either, then I think that would at least be a start. So I think as a slightly extreme position, I would almost say, let's get all the outside intervention out. And if that means that actually in the present term in Syria, that means it's Russia's client state, which it always was, then I would accept that as, if you like, a necessary consequence. I could live with that. What I think the American elite can't do is live with that nor the Saudis, which is why they will keep on with the war. Grand. So with thanks to uh, Wilf for... Um, uh, Sorry, that's a bit depressing. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Uh, with thanks to you for um, that um, amazing talk or lecture, uh, we're going to now break for refreshments. And if there are people who would like to stay for, say, a further... Um, half an hour of conversation around the table to air views uh, uh, more informally and intimately, then make yourself known to Emily and we'll see if there's enough to make that sustainable and plausible after refreshments. Do please join us. Great. Is that, is that something well done? Thank, thank you for listening. I'll promise that in the seminar I'll try and be a bit more positive and optimistic, having given you a very Visual. depressing warning so far. Visual. Great.